thank you so much for making the time today for this interview. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Thanks for reaching out. It's much appreciated. Uh, number one, what will be your top priorities for your party if you are reelected as leader of the Green Party of Manitoba? It's continuing to make the change that we're, we already have been making uh, over you know the past 20 years plus of the Green Party of Manitoba's existence. So you know I, I can point to many different uh, policies over the years, but whether it's opposing factory farming, a basic income, uh, moving away from the use of pesticides, education, property tax reform, uh, same-sex marriage rights, uh, these are all things that Greens have been ahead of the curve and have been champ championing. So, you know, inside or outside of government, we're already making a difference in Manitoba. Beyond that, though, I'd like to continue on my push to get the Green Party of Manitoba to have a full slate of candidates so that every Manitoban had the option to vote Green. That's something we haven't achieved here in Manitoba. It's something I've long been pushing for, but it's something that we do need to achieve. And, you know, to achieve that, we've got to do a couple other things, which is growing the membership. Part of it is if we have more members and more supporters, we're going to be able to run stronger campaigns. And then we're going to ultimately be able to achieve what, of course, we do want to achieve, which is electing Greens into the Manitoba legislature. We, we've seen the difference that just one Green can make with Elizabeth May or Mike Schreiner in Ontario. But now we're even seeing, you know, although it's not the case now, but the Greens governing or, or as part of a governing and supply agreement in British Columbia and in Prince Edward Island where they came, they're the official opposition and came quite close to taking government. I dream of a day uh, where we see a Green majority government in Manitoba. And I think that very well may happen. So those are my top four, which is continuing to make change, running a full slate, growing the membership, and electing Greens. Having been the leader of the Green Party of Manitoba for nearly 12 years, what is your response to Deputy Leader Andrea Shelley's challenge in the race? And if you are re-elected, is there anything you plan to do differently? I'm really glad that Andrea entered the race. I think it's good for our membership to have democratic choice. I, I think it's, it's exciting. It adds some interest to the contest. Uh, I've Really enjoyed working with Andrea as my deputy leader and on the shadow cabinet and, and mentoring and working with her. And I want that co to continue. And I ultimately do want to be successful in the leadership, but I suspect that our, there'll be continuing cooperation between us both now during the race and after. So I think it's great that Andrea stepped forward. In terms of if there's anything I plan to do differently, I don't know about Myself as much personally, but I do think as a party, we continue to grow. And that means that organizationally, we're spreading out. So I think that's really how we need to grow as a party. And of course, as the leader, uh, I do grow along with it uh, as but one member, but one part of it. Now, the Green Party received roughly 6% of voter support in the 2019 provincial election, which is the highest it has been. But as you touched on, the Greens have not yet made it to the provincial legislature. Part of that reason, as you said, is that the party does not have enough active members in each riding to form constituency associations across all ridings. So as a leader, what do you think is needed to shift the attitudes among voters in Manitoba who may have predominantly voted Conservative or NDP in the past and not Green? Sure. I guess the one thing I do want to highlight is because we only ran candidates in about 75% of the ridings, uh, we actually had what I would say is closer to 9% of electoral support. And if you look at broader uh, public opinion polls, they'll show that even as high as 14% on the polls. And we had, uh, obviously, Dave Nickers and Wolseley with uh, well over 30% of the vote and a number of candidates well over 10% of the vote, some pushing close to 20. So I think there is a lot more support that we already have materialized. That said, you're right, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. It's not entirely on the leader. Part of it, as I said, is, is an overall party uh, growing on the organization aspect, but I do think it's really getting out there. I think we have absolutely great candidates. Uh, we have great policies, but we are under-resourced compared to the other parties. That's often where I think we sometimes fall down is that we're not able to get the same level of awareness out because we don't have the same level of resources. So I think that I've been at the door many, many times and talked to many conservative, NDP, liberal, non-voting, whatever else, uh, you know, uh, some communists in Manitoba, we have the Manitoba party and, and any other political affiliation may have, and they're receptive to Greens. And I think they're receptive across the 
spectrum that I think is outdated. I think that's what's unique about the Greens is that we're actually creating uh, a new political frame, a needed political frame in, in a time where we're going into a climate crisis and a global pandemic. So I think people are already receptive to us. It's just we need to do that extra work. And that really does take resources, which, as your question alludes to, means that it really starts with growing the membership because we are ultimately an association of members. The more members we have, the stronger we are as a party, the more able we will be to get out there. As you mentioned, in such an unprecedented era with the climate emergency, the public health crisis, issues like reconciliation and income assistance at the forefront of our discussions every day as Canadians, what opportunities does it present or what challenges? And do you see more Manitobans turning towards the Green Party for representation? I, I definitely do think I see more Manitobans turning to the Green Party for representation. Obviously, we got to continue to do the work. So the challenges, I think, is the same that everyone else is experiencing in COVID, right? Obviously, we're having to try to do things differently. And adjusting is always always a little bit of a challenge. But I think as the first part of your question highlights, this is a moment where I think people are paying attention, where we're realizing the unsustainability of the world as we've designed it. So it's worth highlighting that both linkages in terms of habitat loss have a link towards pandemics in terms of when we break into previously undisturbed wilderness areas, we then have more transmission between the humans that are moving in and the wildlife that was previously there. So not only do we lose the ecological systems that are the lifeblood of this world, but we also now create ourselves as a species more susceptible to diseases. Similarly, there's linkages between a warming planet and pandemics, particularly flus and other uh, diseases, tropical diseases that may move further north. We can go on with linkages on factory farming. So we can see that there are these linkages that it actually creates a risk, and the risks go on when we look at the unsustainability of our food system and how reliant we are on globally shipping food around rather than focusing on a local, healthy, sustainable agriculture system that supplies local people that's more resilient and is more robust, particularly in, in rough times like we're seeing in this pandemic. You, you raised the issue uh, of income uh, assistance and you know one of the things that I often highlight and and it wasn't just me, it was a team effort. But in 2016, we really put out what I think is the, the most detailed basic income proposal of almost any party I've seen anywhere in Canada, including other Greens, if I may say that. And, you know, that really changed the discussion. And, and we could talk about the details of it, but by us doing the work and crunching the numbers and showing people it was possible, we've since forced the other political parties to grant it in half measures, but to adopt our policy that we're right, we need to go towards a basic income. And here we are into the pandemic where we've had to have massive income supports. And I think the question really needs to be asked, how would that have been different had we had a basic income proposal as the Green Party of Manitoba has been suggesting since 2016? I'll admit there's some hard research work similar to what we did in 2015, 2016. And then again, when we updated it ahead of the last election, to really justify that and show those numbers. But that's just one example of where we're being very evidence-based and, and we're leading the way. And I think people are very receptive to that. We've seen the other parties get more in favor of a basic income now in the midst of this pandemic. But it's worth highlighting that we've recognized this all along. And I certainly have no issue if other parties adopt it. Once again, I wanna make sure we see change in the world. That's what I want to accomplish. And the last thing you touched on, which is really important to me, is reconciliation. You know, when you think about people that are, are most impacted by poverty, by our justice system, by our child and family, child and family services system here in Manitoba with the high number of children in care, unfortunately, this is disproportionately Indigenous people in this country. And I've been privileged enough as a lawyer uh, to work with a lot of First Nation communities and residential school survivors, I've been able to travel around the province and, and get a sense and to learn. Uh, my business partner and, and the lawyer that works at my firm, they're, they're both First Nation themselves, so they, I'm also you know, lucky enough to learn a little bit from them. It doesn't mean I have all, all the knowledge, but 
And we located our business on an urban reserve in Winnipeg or just outside of Winnipeg in Headingley and Swan Lake First Nation 8A because we knew it was important uh, to help ensure that our business created jobs for Indigenous people. So I think reconciliation, I really hope we're at a moment where we can finally do the work and move forward. Because since the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry in 1991 and then the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in 1996 and then, and then you had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report in 2017 and then the Murdered, Missing and Indigenous Women and Girls report in 2019 that came out. All of these reports, and, and it's been great work, uh, have laid out a number of recommendations and what we really need to do is start rolling out and implementing those recommendations uh, and making it a reality. And, and fundamentally, it, it starts with priorities. Uh, I, I've long felt that, that what we don't see from the other parties is a focus on priorities. So making Indigenous reconciliation a priority, but also making poverty reduction and ecological protection and fighting climate change a priority. And that means putting the resources behind it. Because when it comes back to reconciliation, some of the work that I see is that it's very inefficient. We're spinning our wheels rather than trying to deal with root issues that exist sometimes in communities where we can have long-term healing. We're just spinning around in the child welfare system or in the justice system, and it, it often doesn't really benefit anyone. So I think that to finally sum up your question that we are in a great unprecedented era, and I lo always love to look back at history and if you look in the following of the 1918 influenza epidemic was vast social changes, 40 hour work week, it took a long time after that, but a moving and growing acceptance towards uh, unionization and workers' rights, income supports for people in old age. We saw a number of big changes in the 1920s. So sometimes after a moment like this, we sort of have a moment to stop, to reflect <laughs> when we're being locked down at home maybe and think about the world and how we could make it different, how we could make a better world. And I think a lot of people are asking that question and they're sort of saying, hey, the Greens have been saying that all along. I've seen change over the tenure of my leadership is we've grown our awareness and our acceptance as a real political party and a, and a viable alternative. And I think there's, there's a moment and I hope 2023 with James Bedham as the leader of the Green Party of Manitoba is that moment where that switch turns on, and I think we might see a wave of Greens elected like uh, no one has ever expected before. And as a follow-up to that question, are you able to provide a quick summary of how, under your leadership, the support for the Green Party of Manitoba has grown over the past few years? I, I'll give you kind of rough numbers. I think our membership has roughly doubled since I became leader in 2008. It's still far, far too small. I think we're just shy of 200 members. So we have a lot more work to be done on, on that end. Our funding has probably about quadrupled. We used to see maybe about 7,000 a year. Now we see about 28,000 a year. Once again, it's still quite meager, but it enables us to do more than we could do when I first took over the leadership. When I first ran as a candidate before I became leader in 2007, we only had 15 candidates out of 57 in Manitoba. Uh, and was one of the things I really wanted to do was to work to expand it out. I grew up in rural Manitoba on a farm myself, so I know that there's life outside of Winnipeg, even though Winnipeg can be very dominant on Manitoba politics. So in 2011, we ran 32 candidates. And in that race, we had candidates. I, I had the highest percentage in Wolseley, just shy of 20 percent, uh, which was sort of a return to the showing of previous leader Marcus Bukart in 2003, but we also had a number of candidates that pushed over 10%. Uh, so sort of if you looked at 2007, most of our candidates were around 5% with Wolseley being our highest at 12% there. Uh, going into 2016, we ran 29 candidates. So we had a small slip down in the number of candidates, but we once again increased our, our overall support in that race, Dave Nickers came within 400 votes of almost winning in Wolseley. We were very close, but just not quite there. I myself had about 18% in my local riding. Uh, I think Dave had around 36%. Uh, and once again, we had a num an increasing number of candidates pushing over 10%. In the last election, we ran 43 candidates out of 57. So uh, that's more candidates than we've ever ran before, but I, I still haven't achieved the full slate that I've always wanted to achieve. It's uh, 
I'd love to have achieved it already, to be honest, but sometimes things are a slow slog and you just got to stick at it. Dave, once again, came with about 36% of the vote, although unfortunately uh, didn't quite come through either. I, I once again held about my 18%. Uh, but really interesting in some real areas like Morden, uh, in Arthur Verdon, in, in Spruce Woods. So we had candidates like Mike Yurichuk, uh, Ken Henry down in Borderland, my dad, Gordon Bedham in Spruce Woods, uh, Robert Brown in Brandon West, and uh, Dave Neufeld in, in Arthur Verdon. And just a couple uh, examples where I think those candidates were coming in with four, uh, most around 11 to 14% of support. And I, I certainly recognize that you know, that's a distance off of, of what we need to elect Greens. But of course, one of the things that Greens that I guess I didn't talk about in this interview and could is been pushing for is proportional representation. So part of it is the nature of our system. But I do look at those numbers and sort of compare them sometimes to both how the federal party has done nationally and how other provincial parties have done. And I think, you know, honestly, our results are quite respectable. Um, they're not everything I want. I, I, I want to elect Greens. I want the, the, the election where we storm away and take the government and no one saw it coming. But I think they are honestly quite respectable. And, you know, there is a moment to look, look on them and reflect and say, you know, we achieved something that, that maybe it didn't go as forward as fast as I would have liked. And I often worry that I don't know that the planet can, can wait sometimes trying to be hardworking and patient and work away at it. And I worry, you know, we don't have the time, but you always got to start. Um, at my first campaign, it's one of my favorite campaigns in Minnesota. I, my campaign headquarters was a bike trailer and a tent behind my bike. And I pedaled 220 or 250 kilometers from small town to small town, knocking on doors. And when I ran, I was talking to my grandma, um, who's since deceased at the time about it. And saying, you know, we need more sustainable farms. And she said, you know, we, they were talking about that, that in the 70s and they didn't do it. And my commenter at the time, and I think it still resonates when I think about the slow slog was, you know, um, you're right, grandma, they didn't. But if we don't do it now, it'll never change. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is right now. And, and so, you know, you have to keep at it and just keep slogging away and and keep pushing away because uh, what else can we do? My number is really easy. It's 204-99-JAMES. That's 204-995-2637. I make that a matter of public record if people want to reach out to me. I'm basically on Facebook. I think I'm Green James Bedham. And on Twitter, I'm James Bedham. And on Instagram, I'm James Bedham. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much.